Welcome to The Fashion Show, a five-part series put together by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation to explore what the circular economy means for the fashion industry. My name is Seb and I was on the first episode of this series and I'm back as your host today. Um, and I'm soon going to be joined along with my co-host by three fashion industry innovators. Um, but before we reach them, we also want your interaction and your input into this show. So make sure that you use the comments feature on whichever of the channels you're watching this on exists. So Facebook, Twitter or YouTube, post your questions, comments and chat relating to this session there. And people, will three, uh, people behind the scenes here will feed those through to us. Um, but I'm joined by my co-host today, Marilyn. Marilyn, you're part of the Make Fashion Circular team here at the Foundation. And in the first episode of this series, uh, Make Fashion Circular lead Francois said that the greatest innovation challenge that faces this industry is how do we change the fundamental operator model? How do we scale some of these innovative businesses? So what are we going to be talking about today? Uh, thanks, Seb. Um, so today we're going to be talking about um, just that because I think that what is what is worth mentioning is that up until now, the industry has grown by producing and selling more. So actually in the last 15 years, clothing production has doubled. And, and right now the industry produces around 150 billion pieces of clothes for um, seven, 7 billion humans in the world. So that's over 20 new pieces of clothes per year per person. Um, and I think that right now, the, the, this huge influx of, of clothes has meant that people like us are no longer satisfied with a fashion experience. So people report um, feeling overwhelmed because of the amount of choice when shopping, but also because you don't know what to wear anymore in the morning and it takes you uh, so long. Um, I actually, uh, globally, I think people only wear around 50% of their wardrobe. And in the UK, which is where we live, um, that number is at, is as low as 30%. Um, and at the same time, there's like disappointment with the fashion experience because sometimes when you order online, it doesn't meet your expectations um, or you just don't find your size. And, and that has meant that um, overall people are just disengaged from, from this experience. Uh, and obviously the pandemic hasn't helped, right? Because now, um, more than ever before, we've used uh, a, an even smaller proportion of our wardrobe and there is economic uncertainty. So here today we are going to answer. So how can how can the fashion industry really make us enjoy um, our wardrobes more and, and what is the future of our wardrobes? It's so true what you say, though, that, you know, we have way more clothes than wear that people who watch the foundation's broadcast regularly might think I only own about three shirts and two jumpers. But there's actually a load of clothes in my wardrobe that are underutilized. Um, but to dig into this a little bit more today, we have got three pioneers or guests who are part of pioneering organizations on the frontier of this challenge. Um, so we will be joined by Sarah Erickson, who's the business development lead at, uh, for sustainability of H&M Group. Um, Lulu O'Connor, who is the founder and CEO of Cloves Doctor and uh, Michaela Lazoaisa, who's the COO of Hack Your Closet, a pioneering model. We're going to hear more about each of those organizations. Um, and I want to start with you, uh, Sarah, if that's OK. H&M um, Group, obviously an, an enormous fashion company. Could you tell us a little bit briefly about how the organization is tackling the topic of different business models and some examples um, of that in action? Yes, so first, uh, thank you for having us here today. Really great to be joined by good company. Uh, but I think for us, it all comes down to the customer. And I think today, more than ever, when you talk about customer expectations or customer trends, we also need to see it through the lens of the pandemic. And I think what we have seen is an acceleration in the, in the digital transformation. We see an increased uh, interest for sustainability topics. And we can also... Uh, we might see a possible limitation in spend in the years to come. And we do believe that circular business models could be the answer to this. And to meet that, I mean, we will have to deliver on conveniency. I think we need to bring the services that could actually prolong the life of garments uh, into the, to the current customer behavior. So like something that we did with the H&M Take Care concept, where you can repair your clothes in store. But now we also have to put that then in a digital context context going forward and I also see that we need to deliver more sustainable options and also talk more about uh, the impact that that will actually have and and have that conversation and dialogue with the customer 
And also we need to focus then on affordability. And here we see that e-commerce or secondhand and vintage could be the answer to something where you can still access exciting fashion, but at a reduced price. And that is something that the majority of our brands has already been testing and piloting and are currently offering today. And I think the last news within that it last uh, addition would be the cost resell project that was launched a month ago where the cost customer can both sell and buy pre-owned garments at the cost platform. So, uh, so I think also we need to answer I mean, the customer behaviors and ask them if that is what they are uh, uh, expecting from us and keep the dialogue going. And just, just a quick follow up on that. So you've talked about some of the big sort of macro issues in terms of customer engagement, affordability. How is H&M approaching that? Are you, it sounds almost like you're just piloting a lot of different things to try to understand how that plays out with customers. Is that, is that a fair summation? Uh, yes, I mean, we have, of course, the ambition to make things at scale to, to reach the impact that I was mentioning. But we see that the only way to, to get to scale is to continue to test and learn. Uh, and, of course, always making things uh, grow. Um, but it's for us as a really big organization, we, we need also to, to monitor in, in a sustainable way, both from a people and planet perspective, and then test and learn and validate our assumptions to make sure that what we do will actually get the effect that we are aiming for. Um, that's great. Thank you, Sarah. And I think that uh, we, are, we are definitely going to explore more of those um, pilots that you are working on um, in a second. But I think that it would be great if Lulu can explain uh, her pioneering um, or organization, which is called Clothes Doctor. Hi there. Yes, it's great to be with you. Um, Clothes Doctor is a clothing care brand, and we basically provide repairs, alterations, and restoration treatments for clothes through our website. And we also provide a range of care products which are intended to help people you know, look after their clothes. So things like brushes and combs and gentle detergents for hand washing garments and things like that. Um, we also have a really nice section on our site where we provide information to help people kind of understand how to look after their wardrobe. Um, because I think that's one of the big issues that we see in the industry is we feel that you know, a lot of customers and consumers around the world have slightly lost touch with you know, the origin of their garments and fabrics and how things are actually made and therefore how to look after them. And, you know, I think our parents and our grandparents' generations were very good at caring for clothes and they knew how to mend things um, and they would look after things really well. But I think, you know, in a lot of Western countries anyway, you know, we don't really have those skills anymore. We're not really taught that kind of thing in schools and we don't necessarily understand about how the garments actually should be looked after. So that's a big part of what we try to do. That's great. So you will say that, I guess, that you're also working in uh, customer empowerment, right? To empower them to really, you know, have this engagement and this dialogue and, and this connection with their clothes again, which is something that we might have lost in the last decade or more. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and I think, you know, for a, a good example of that would be we find that a lot of the garments that we um, work on, actually, on our services side, um, will have... They many, many garments will have a dry clean only label in them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we certainly believe that this is something that often is unnecessary. And actually a lot of garments out there don't actually have to be dry cleaned. It's quite a sort of standard um, thing that producers will use to just be, you know, a fail safe that they will, they will put on many, many different types of garments. So things made of silk, cashmere, wool, for example, will often all have a dry clean only label. But, you know, dry cleaning is actually very damaging for the planet. It can also damage clothes over time. And so a lot of what we try to do is try to explain to people that there are other ways to care for clothes, for example, that often those can be hand washed um, to better effect than dry cleaning. And so that's a good example, I think, of where it's a quite simply just a sort of maybe a, a miscommunication or a sort of people being slightly out of touch with, um, you know, what those garments actually are and how they can care for them in other ways. And there might literally be a couple of people watching this show who are thinking, I don't have time to also look after my clothes. But I guess your experience is that there are many people who 
are really enthused by that and see the massive benefits that it can deliver for them in the medium to long term. Yeah, I think it's it's an incredibly satisfying experience, to be honest, um, to actually, you know, speaking from personal experience, and the reason I started the company was because I had a very large wardrobe in, in a previous life, in a previous job, and it was full of different items of clothing that I had bought over the years. I had shopped online a lot. I filled up my wardrobe. I had a lot of items in there which I never wore or were slightly damaged or... Um, you know, I didn't really know how they should be looked after and I just left them in there and I never really did anything about it. But actually going through that process of cleaning out my wardrobe, working out what I wanted to keep, what suited me, what didn't, um, and actually how to look after those things, mending the ones that I wanted to um, keep wearing um, and working out how they should really be cleaned and cared for. I think it's a really sort of empowering experience and, and you know, I can now go into my wardrobe and I find it sort of a pleasure to actually look at it and I can actually see what's at the back now. And Michaela, um, Hack Your Closet, what is it in a nutshell? Well, <clears throat> Hack Your Closet is on a mission, mission to reduce waste and pre prevent waste in the clothing industry. And we want to challenge ownership of clothes. So we do this by taking clothes out of the waste stream and prolong their use phase. Um, it could be recommerced, it could be pre-loved, secondhand items, but also overproduced clothes from different brands. And we match the style of those clothing items with our customers' style profile and send them four items each month that they can use for as long as they want before they return them to us. Uh, we always keep ownership of all the clothes and circulate them between our customers to make use of all the items for as much as possible. Um, that's awesome. And, and how are you ensuring that actually the, the clothes that you send match the style of the, of the users? Yeah, this is something that we're constantly developing because style is quite uh, difficult to explain what i like or what i think is trendy or minimal might not be uh, the same for another person um, so once you sign up you go through a style uh, survey where we ask a lot of questions that we have developed to understand better your style and uh, all the clothes also have a certain style so we can match that together uh, with all the data we collect and of course the more boxes you get, the more fine-tuned your style profile will become, thanks to all the collected feedback that you give us and all the inspirational pictures that you can upload. So in the end, we have a huge database with customer preferences that knows what you want yeah. and like better than yourself. Uh, and also a growing history about all the items that we circulate, which is really fun to look back to later. Okay, so if I get it correctly, then you use, I guess, use clothes that you circulate to different users and then you make sure that they actually use it by matching it to what they like to wear, right? Yeah, and then we collect a lot of feedback and we fine tune the profile. That's great. It's like mixing, I guess, like the data analytics with what actually people are enjoying um, so that they have a nicer experience. It would be quite an eye-opening experience, Marilyn, to learn what clothes we actually like to wear, wouldn't it? <laughs> to know my style profile, it would be like quite, quite an eye-opening experience. There are many who come back to us and say, oh, I would never buy this item, but when I tried it on, I love it. So thank you for uh, making me go out of my comfort zone. That's really nice to hear, which brings me to the next que question, actually, Michaela. Um, which is how do you see people's relationship with fashion moving forward? And um, so how, how does that impact the future for wardrobes? Yeah, I think as it is now, the relationship between a brand and a customer ends once the garment is sold in a linear business model and there's no further engagement after sales. And as we move towards more circular business model, I think we're going to interact more with the customers as well after sales. And uh, that is what we have seen with our customers. We keep ownership of all the clothes and therefore it's really important to, to track all the clothes because uh, what can be measured can be managed. Um, I think that we're gonna have a quite minimal closet with high quality, sustainably made 
basic items in our wardrobe and maybe rotate more eccentric seasonal and fun items to keep the curiosity and, and the adventurous mind happy. Um, but all of those items that we rotate need to be traceable uh, and connected so that we can easily track everything and yeah. We actually had a question in online, um, Michaela, about the scale of Hack Your Closet. What, what scale is it kind of operating at now and what are the plans in the future to increase that scale? Yeah, so today we are operating in whole Sweden and we're currently only available for women and uh, not yet for men, but that oh. would be so much fun to start with. Um, we have about 1,500 customers in Sweden right now. Uh, we started one year ago and we're looking forward to expand to other countries. Um, we have a goal to reach seven different countries in Europe uh, within 2025. Um, so that's what we're aiming for. So keep your eyes peeled then, I guess, for everyone who's hearing. Yeah. Um, and I guess we can ask the same question to you, um, Lulu. In some ways, it sounds like part of Clove's doctor mission, Clove's doctor's mission is to put yourself out of business because on one hand, you provide these kind of services that, uh, that help people to take care of their clothes. On the other hand, you provide education and empowerment to help people do it themselves. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly right. So I think for us, it's not, um, we don't see that there's a clash between educating people about how to repair their clothes and actually providing that service. Um, because in many ways, a lot of the reason I think that people don't get their clothes repaired is because they don't understand what can be done. And so by providing things like the tutorials that you can find on our website, you can actually learn if you really want to <laughs> spend a lot of time learning how to do it, but you also understand that it can look amazing when, you know, for example, if you're darning a jumper that has a moth hole in it, you can see that it can be done perfectly by an expert. You can learn the technique for doing it, but you can also see that it takes time um, and it really is a, a very sort of highly skilled thing to do. And so you can then take your pick, either you learn how to do it or you send it to us and we can do it for you. But I think the important thing is actually instead of just assuming that when something is damaged that it needs to go in the bin or what many people do, they send it to a charity shop and then it ends up indirectly going in the bin. Um, you know, you can, there are actually other options. And I think the opportunity to grow the market and to help people understand that, that they can make that choice not to throw away is something that's going to be much bigger for us than you know the difference between someone trying to do it themselves at home so that's that's the way we think about it and i think you know generally obviously raising awareness um spreading the word and it's it's a very important part of our our ethos and our mission is to is to help people learn to do that so um in the future then do you think that people will actually care more for their clothes and really treasure what they own is that how you do you how you envision the future or? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with Michaela. Um, you know, the, I think the, the pendulum has swung very far in favor of kind of low priced, a lot of low priced garments being purchased, particularly in the UK, but in, in many markets. Um, and, you know, I think generally consumers are getting frustrated with that. There is growing awareness about the damage that that's doing. Um, I think in large part, you know, often that damage is hidden from Western consumers um, and it happens somewhere else in the world. And that's why, you know, it takes a lot to sort of build awareness of, of that damage. But I think as a result, you know, people becoming more aware, I think people will start to choose, you know, slightly higher quality garments. Um, and, you know, as they choose higher quality garments and slightly more expensive garments, people really start to see the value of those clothes as well. You know, if we speak from personal experience the vast majority of the stuff that we repair will be at the more premium end the more luxury garments because it's obvious to people you know that there's value in really taking care of those um, and so I believe that's the way the market will go I, I agree with Michaela I think our wardrobes will have fewer items in them um, probably slightly more expensive items which are more sustainably made 
um, and that, you know, I personally am a big fan of rental. And in fact, this <laughs> item that I'm wearing today is rented. Um, and I think that's going to be for me and for many other people, I think that's going to become a really important part of, you know, getting the excitement of buying something new or getting something new doesn't have to come from an actual purchase. It can come from, you know, this item I rent for a month and then I return it and I get something else. And, you know, I think that's going to be a really important way to keep your the sort of fashion element and the style and keep things fresh in your wardrobe um, but you know not necessarily have everything working in a in a sort of linear framework and and just going into the bin at the end of it so smaller but better smaller water but better exactly some great questions coming in online so thank you to everyone who's sending those through i want to come back to you um sarah so obviously in fact i may be able to ask, put one of the um questions that we've had on, online directly to you because it kind of fits into the theme that we've um, been talking about here about the transformation of people's relationship with fashion. Um, obviously, um, what, what Mehdi here is picking out is that the that retailers and fashion brands, their revenue is coming currently mostly through selling new clothes. And that's almost a bit of a locked in model in the sense that you, you have to keep delivering against that. So how does H&M Group look at this sort of shift in people's relationship with clothes in the context of also being a bit big business that clearly needs to also deliver against, uh, you know, for example, their shareholders that need to demonstrate growing revenue streams? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think, I mean, like both Miguel and Lulu is, is mentioning, there is a, the industry sees the needs of change, but what will probably not change is this desire for news value and access so I think what we need to focus on as a big company is, like you mentioned, how can we decouple the monetary growth from the, from the use of virgin resources? And once again, that's when we see that circular business model is the answer to that uh, equation, where we see that we can still deliver on fashion and news value. We can still keep some kind of pleasure in, in expressing who we are through fashion but it doesn't necessarily need to be a one-on-one -on -one relation to extracting uh, virgin resources to, to be able to deliver that. Um, so I really think that it will all be about access, exactly like Michaela and Lulu is talking about. Can we, can we access fashion through rental, through one-off rental, through subscription rental, uh, by turning those, those items in different ways, whether it's e-commerce and you really like sell things and with the money that you give, get, maybe you will buy something that someone else has used before you. Uh, and also I think, in parallel, I mean, if we start to create a greater awareness about the, um, the actual value of your clothes when it comes to the, to the impact that they have on the climate and how we start to cherish that and, and spend more both maybe time, like you say, Lulu, but if we don't have time, then we might spend money to, to repair them. And that could be then an income that is decoupled from the use of virgin resources. And so I would say, I mean, that our, our we will still focus on delivering news value, uh, desire for fashion to make it fun and, and accessible. But, but can we try to do that with less resources? And we talked a bit about some of the pilots earlier that H&M Group are delivering. Are you also inspired by some of the examples of these fast growing, small repair and resale businesses like like uh, the two that we have on the show today is that also kind of a sign of this uh, shift in the industry definitely i think i mean this is i mean from the start this is nothing that we can do on our own it needs to be through collaboration i mean i said it to michaela before the start sh the show started that i have been in meetings with her colleague lisa for, for the last weeks talking about potential collaboration and I know that other colleagues of mine have been uh, in dialogue with with close doctors so of course I think we see a network building up with where we have common common goals common visions and we can we can really do it together mm. That's great. And um, I think that there's also a question right now that is coming in, uh, which talks about that's uh, close as a service model. And I think that just to explain, and um, thanks for um, whoever asked that question. So um, close as a service model, in a sense, it's, you know, you pay monthly, like a monthly fee, and then you get your clothes delivered to your house um, for a whatever period of time, usually it's a month, and then 
um, it goes back to the platform or the retailer um, and then you get new ones the next month. And I think that in terms of if there are, if there are examples, um, of course there are. I think the biggest ones that the industry knows and has with the biggest amount of users um, is Y Closet in China and Rent the Runway in, in the US. However, right now, um, and I mean, I can, I can pass that to, to, the, to our guests because that's exactly what Mikael is doing to some extent, which is, um, you know, like getting, getting these secondhand clothes um, and rotating them by making people pay a monthly fee so that they get access to them uh, every month. And, and also H&M to some extent um, had a pilot with H&M brand um, on one of rental where you will pay to get access to this um, dress for a weekend or a couple of days um, so that you don't have to buy it. So I think that maybe Mikhail, if you want to explain a little bit more of like this clothing as a service to, so that the audience can really understand um, what does it look like in, in fashion, it would be great. I think so. The biggest players that we have seen, as you say, Rent the Runway, Y Closet, um, there are a few more um, players in the industry that, is, that are making more kind of occasional wear. And, uh, you know, if you're going to a party or a, or a wedding, you want to wear a dress. And usually those items are only bought and used once, and then you don't have any occasions to wear it again. Uh, so that's great. Uh, what we are focusing a bit more is the everyday clothes. Uh, we're trying to convert it more to a lifestyle service that you have to change your mentality of how you consume clothes rather than, rather than a rental service. Um, we see that an average clothing items that you can, can wear every day in your basic wardrobe, the average is about eight times. I've seen different numbers, but we can rotate an item for 48 usages it's usages not um it, ro rotation um so it's really it's like human psychology something that is limited and that you have a limited amount of time like rental that item or that thing you will use it much more uh, because it tends to have a higher value to you um and you're going to want to use it as often as you can before the time runs out um, but instead, if you're buying an item, you're going to think, oh, I can, I can wear it any day. Let's wear it tomorrow instead. And then it ends up in your water waiting for, for three years. Um, so I think that's another value to rentals, that the, the items get uh, more valuable to the consumers because they have it a limited amount of time. A question for you, Lulu. Um, I guess... The this conversation is quite distinct in its character in the sense it's an extremely hopeful, positive conversation we've had over the last 25 minutes or so. Um, and fashion has this sort of strange paradox. We've talked a lot about the positive side of the value of being able to wear many different things and how that makes people feel. Then it has this sort of negative association of, of being maybe wasteful. And, and there's many articles and videos and things that are made about that. What makes you hopeful and feel positive about the future of fashion? I just think the, the, the dialogue and, and the raising awareness that we've seen over the last couple of years, um, you know, when, when I started this business in 2017, nobody was talking about this that I could see anyway. And when we had customers come to us to get something repaired, it would only ever be because, you know, they wanted to wear it again. But now we actually see, A, many more customers coming to us um, wanting to, to look after their garments, but also many of them actually say, you know, I just don't want to throw this away because I just don't think, you know, it shouldn't just be another item that goes into landfill. And I think that's a really interesting change that we've seen um, over the last, I think it probably in, in the UK, it probably really ramped up when the Environmental Audit Committee did um, a sort of investigation about 18 months ago. Um, and that really started to, to sort of raise awareness and, and bring kind of headlines around um, the damage that the fashion industry does. And I think as a result, you know, it really has started to change people's mindsets. And I think the, 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 the reaction has been really phenomenal. And, and while there's, you know, obviously a lot more work to do, I think that it's, it's really moving in the right direction. Um, and, and I think that that is a really, really positive thing. 
That's, that's a nice, not nice way to conclude. Um, I think we're about time. So to, to sum up, I think, well, thanks, thanks all for being present here. And thank you to the audience as well for, for the great questions. And I'm sorry if we didn't get around to answering all of those. Um, but I think that to sum up, it is great to see how um, the industry is really moving towards this increasing use and, and really trying. I think with these examples, we can we can really understand how how we can transform the industry from one that is based on just producing and selling more towards one that grows uh, by using more. Um, and I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, Seb, but I think that these all of these examples are great in really making us enjoy our wardrobes more and and really. Um, I guess change the dialogue and and interaction that we have with our clothes. Um. So thank you so much as well to you at home for watching, and hopefully we've helped to change that dialogue a little bit as Marilyn described. To find out more about our work um, on Make Fashion Circular, do take a look at the foundation's website. I'm sure some of the people behind the scenes have put those links in the various comments boxes. And don't forget to join us next week at the same time, the same place, 12 o'clock UK time, GMT currently, um, where we'll be diving in again with another group of innovators, this time focusing on the materials that go into our fashion project uh, products. So we look forward to seeing you then. Um, and see you next time on The Fashion Show.